Waterloo movie review. So this is obviously a movie about Waterloo, the famous battle where Napoleon was defeated. Uh, it's a 1970 movie, and according to Wikipedia, it was actually uh, made by the Russians. Uh, but everyone speaks English in the movie, so I, I don't... Well, I, I don't really know any more than what I read in Wikipedia. Uh, apparently it was Russian-made or Russian-financed or... Of course, 1970 was the Soviet Union back then, wasn't it? Uh, but all the actors are English or American or speaking in English. So it's, it's essentially an English language film. Uh, and this is, of course, the famous story about Napoleon's Battle of Waterloo. So this is another one for the history buffs. I am somewhat embarrassed to admit how little I actually knew about Waterloo before watching this movie. And I, I'm embarrassed to say that because I'm a history buff. So I'm the kind of person who should know this. But, uh, you know, my, I remember my middle school history teacher... Uh, had told us uh, that Waterloo was Napoleon's first defeat. And he went on to explain that that's why Waterloo is used now in common parlance to mean when somebody gets defeated after, after having a, a string of victories. Like, you know, you have a, a string of successes, and then you stumble and people say, ah, he met his Waterloo. And, and to be fair to my history teacher, I think that is actually how it's used as an expression. But... I was surprised to learn that uh, this was actually not Napoleon's first defeat. Uh, and th this is stuff I all learned in the first 20 minutes of the movie. So the movie opens actually with Napoleon after his disastrous Russian campaign. And he's been defeated by all the Allied armies, the Russians and the Austrians and the English, and then they're all coming down uh, and he, he's he can't hold them off any longer and he's in Paris and he has to surrender and they ship him out to this island. And they put the king back on the throne, uh, Louis the, what was it, Louis the 18th, who incidentally in this movie they got Orson Welles to play him. Uh, Orson Welles by 1970 is well into his fat and grumpy stage. Uh, although apparently, some I read a review saying that Louis the 18th was actually quite grumpy himself, so uh, apparently it's a somewhat accurate portrayal. Um, but then, Napoleon escapes off this island, escapes back to France, uh, comes into France, and he's is a fugitive at this time because uh, the King Louis XVIII is back on the throne. So they send the army out to capture him, and Napoleon just walks out to the army and says, Guys, it's me, your old commander. You wouldn't shoot me, would you? I, I'm paraphrasing, but, but something like that. And the army just comes back over to him. Uh, and then he marches on Paris, and the Louis XVIII has to flee. And then the Allied armies are like, what? Napoleon's back. And they all organize. And then that's when the Battle of Waterloo takes place. So it wasn't Napoleon's first defeat. It was after Napoleon had miraculously escaped after being defeated once and come back and retake in France that the Waterloo battle happened. Now, I, in retrospect, I'm embarrassed to admit I never knew any of this before the movie. I have since, since seeing this movie read up on this a little bit more, so I, I've filled in that gap in my knowledge now. But all this uh, happens in the first 20 minutes of the movie, before we even get to the Battle of Waterloo, as a prologue. Uh, and it's fascinating. Uh, and then the rest of the movie deals with the build-up to and then the fighting of the Battle of Waterloo, at which Napoleon fights his last great battle against the combined forces of the British, led by, of course, the Duke of Wellington, and the Prussians. Now, I don't know enough to critique the historical accuracy of this movie, but you definitely get the feeling that it's trying very hard to be accurate. Uh, as the armies clash and then lose and gain ground over the field of Waterloo, the subtitles mention the time of the day this is going on and identify which part of the battlefield the action is on. 
you get the impression that it's all supposed to be accurate. Again, I, I don't know enough to say if it was accurate for sure or not, but you definitely get the impression that this is supposed to be accurate. Uh, the big problem with this movie is that the director seems to have been too ambitious for his own good. Uh, you get the impression watching this movie that he wanted to create the Citizen Kane of war, of war movies. Uh, he wanted a movie that would sweep the awards that everyone would talk about over and over again in film schools. But there's a fine line between greatness and pretentiousness. A lot of the more inventive camera shots or angles just struck me as the director trying too hard. For example, when Napoleon is confronted by Louis XVIII's army after returning to France, he walks slowly he walks out slowly to talk to them with his hands held out. The camera zooms in and stays on his hands as he walks, then continues the close-up as Napoleon puts his hands behind his back. And there were a lot more creative shots like this. Now, maybe I'm just a Philistine about these things, uh, but it struck me as pointless. I, I'm sure a film school student would have appreciated a lot more than I did. Although, again, uh, this was a Soviet film, so maybe this is just a difference in style between American films and Russian films. I don't know. Speaking of a difference in style, though, for my money, in my impression, there was a lot of overacting going on in this film. At times, I got the impression that the actors thought they were on stage, acting out like a Shakespearean play. Uh, the actors would start off talking quietly and then abruptly start shouting dramatically with their hands raised out in front of them and then abruptly lower their voice again for dramatic effect. Uh, something that you would associate with the theater or, or the stage, but which doesn't work so well in a movie or which at least struck me as coming off a little bit cheesy in a movie. Plus, this is a long movie. Uh, granted, it's not quite as long as Lord of the Rings, but it, it is over two hours long, which was, you know, a long movie for its day. And a lot of the length of the movie seems to come in from things like long zooming in shots, or dramatic silence between characters, or just a lot of artsy things going on that probably could have been left on the cutting room floor, in my opinion, and speeded up the pace of the movie. Now, there's a lot of build-up before the battle even begins, but once the Battle of Waterloo finally begins, it is pretty exciting. Uh, although, I don't know, it's nothing special either. And now, granted, this was 1970, so this was before computer graphics or anything like that. Uh, so considering that this was all real, I mean, you know, real horses, real cavalry charge, uh, real actors. Uh, it is pretty impressive, but I don't know. I, I thought it was a little bit lacking, uh, even by the standards of its day. Like, I remember watching Spartacus as a kid and feeling like those battles were really impressive and really exciting. Uh, this one seems a bit different, although granted, the purpose is different. Uh, Spartacus was never supposed to be like a historically accurate representation of a battle. This one, they're really trying hard with these historical accuracies. So, you know, the Calvary charges uh, took place. They're trying to show how it took place, under what circumstances. And, and that kind of thing is great for historical accuracy, but maybe doesn't make as an exciting as a battle scene, uh, as, as something that's going more for a, a good action sequence. Now there's this odd part in one of the battle scenes when a young British soldier suddenly loses his cool during the battle. He breaks out of formation, he wanders around during the French cavalry charge, and he starts shouting out repeatedly, Why are we killing each other? We don't even know each other. Why must we kill each other? Uh, a, a rather obvious 
anti-war polemic inserted right into the middle of the film. And I don't know if this is because it's a Soviet film or because this is 1970 and it's right during the Vietnam War, but, but it seemed like something that was right during the Vietnam War that was inter imposed retroactively on the film. I mean, did I don't think this really happened during the Battle of Waterloo. Now, I'm anti-war myself. Uh, I'm a pacifist myself, so I, I appreciate what they're trying to do, but it just didn't seem to fit with the rest of the tone of the film, uh, and it, it took me out, uh, took me out of the film. So, um, yeah, I felt, I felt like it felt a little bit tacked on. Still, you, you do have to appreciate that this was during a time when anti-war was on everyone's mind. So, you know, like nowadays, Hollywood would, could make like a, a big budget war film and they wouldn't even feel the need maybe to acknowledge uh, that, uh, that to acknowledge the anti-war side of it, or to, to acknowledge uh, <clears throat> the tragedy of war, or that war is problematic. Uh, yeah, so in a way you do appreciate what they were trying to do in 1970. It, it was a little bit clumsily done. And th there are a few other nods in the movie that are a bit clumsily done. Still, in spite of all its flaws, if you're a history buff, I this this movie is definitely recommended. It's an older movie, but it's worth tracking down.